Yes. Okay. So, hello to be here to share some of our experience, our opinions on uh, what this country is going through. It's uh, a coincidence, I suppose, that today also happens to be the anniversary of one of the greatest revolutionaries the world has seen, V.I. Lenin. And apart from everything else, uh, a point of great interest today when we are talking about a pandemic is that after the First World War and during that war, the contagion of the what was then called the Spanish flu, which took so many millions of lives across the world. This was one of the, and it is extremely educative that right then, just when a new state was born, when there were so many problems, one of the most important aspects which Lenin focused on was the need for strengthening public health. And the way the new Soviet state dealt with that pandemic, I think, has lessons for us even today. And one of the basic lessons is that a society which uses its resources not for the few, for the rich, for those who already have the means to survive, but to build systems which the poorest of the poor can access towards equality within the right to health. I think that was one of the very early lessons of the Bolshevik Revolution. And today when we discuss um, what has happened in this coronavirus era that we are going through, I think that lesson of also looking beyond the immediate to look at social systems which can help us today and which are important for us to deal with it, to learn lessons for the future, I think also is a very important point when we pay our tribute to the great revolutionary Comrade Lenin. So what do we see? The theme of today's um, discussion amongst us is the need for unity unity of the people, unity of the country, and a united will and effort for all of us, for each and every citizen, to come together to fight this coronavirus. And obviously the framework for the fight is set out by the government. It requires physical distancing. It requires a medical framework, it requires an economic framework, and it requires a social framework. But I think we all agree that without a united will, it would be very difficult for us here in India with uh, so many problems we are already facing to really come out of it. And if we look at the last month, I'm not going back to January when the first warnings came, but I'm talking very specifically of the period of the lockdown. So if we look as to what we have experienced from March 24th, when it was known all over India that this is what needs to be done. So how did people react? How did ordinary citizens react? And I think this is one of uh, something that we can all be really very proud of, that it was the common person, the ordinary citizen, who understood, in spite of all the problems that they knew would be caused in their own lives and their own families, but they stood by the understanding that this is what is required to save our soul and to save our country. So we can say with a certain amount of certainty and also clarity that as far as the people of India are concerned, the last month has shown 
a tremendous united will from the people of India, the ordinary citizens of India, to try and observe those guidelines which the government has put before them. So there is no issue here that anybody, whether it's a political party, whether it is um, any particular community, whether it is any particular region, I don't think there's anybody in this country at all who would question the need for unity and national unity. And yet today, why is it or what is it that prevents this unity from being sustained, to prevent breaches in this unity? Are there any impediments to a united will of the people of India? What are the policies? What are the perceptions? What are the perspectives which we have to understand to really answer the question as to what are the impediments? I think, obviously, this pandemic has not occurred in a vacuum. It has come to India in a very particular context, in an economic context, where India was already in the throes of a deep recession, driven by the policies of the government, driven by the framework of economic policies that India has been um, functioning within, um, known as the new liberal framework of economic policies. And that has caused this huge recession. It has caused very high unemployment rates. And it has caused obscene inequalities. So this was the economic aspect of uh, this context of the pandemic. If we look at the political context, we saw what was happening in Delhi. And we had seen during the Delhi elections the totally cynical approach and attitude of the central ruling party in trying to win seats by resorting to, I think, the worst kind of communal toxic rhetoric that we have seen. And we have seen a great deal of it. But I think the Delhi elections was really, I mean, in a negative way, a terrible landmark for a low in Indian politics. I'm not going into those details. You are aware of it. And it also happened that as an, an immediate aftermath of the communalized campaign which was run, we had a situation in Delhi where since the 1950s, I think since partition, we have not seen the kind of Hindu-Muslim violence that we saw starting from February 23rd, that is almost exactly a month before the lockdown was announced. And during a period when the entire world was aware of the coronavirus, where the government of India was aware of the coronavirus, where in a state like Kerala, the cases had already come and there was total preparation to fight the coronavirus. So there were two ends of the country. We had Kerala, where it was a completely different context, a political context where the government understood and realized the necessity of prioritizing this. And we had the capital of India, the capital of India, the seat of power, where we were in the midst of communal violence. And a communal violence which developed, really, into violence which was totally backed by the police here in Delhi. And therefore, after the first day, it really became one-sided violence. So unity had already been disrupted. There was the election results. BJP was smashed in the election results. The our party formed government with a huge majority. So that should have put an end to it. But in fact, as we saw very soon after, we had the communal violence in Delhi. And in other parts of the country also, we had the context of the extremely significant anti-CAA movement. And why I say significant is because although parliament had passed this law, uh, the Citizenship Amendment Act. But what we saw was that 
the people of India, and in particular, led by the, a big section of articulate minorities of India, who challenged it. And there were struggles, there were spontaneous struggles all through India. So this was also a very important context. Another important context was the working class strike uh, in January, which had organized 20 crore or more workers in a united action against the economic policy. So, so we had both. We had both aspects. One, the divisive nature, and in contrast to that, the united struggle of people against the anti-CA. We had the attack, the recession, the attack on the economic rights of the people, and we had uh, an alliance of the working people in both cities and rural areas again. So this was the context. Now, in that context, when we talk about unity, when we talk about the need for unity, we don't suddenly start suffering from amnesia and say, oh, it's just going to come automatically or spontaneously. But I think what is important for us to note that in spite of that context, which was such a troubled context on the one hand, and a context where there was resistance growing on the other hand. Within that real context, in real time, we had the lockdown. And the people responded. The people responded across communities, and I would say across classes, although of course it was mainly a middle class response, but certainly I would say across classes, because we saw in many working class areas also, there was a response to the Prime Minister's call for all Indians to come out and, you know, I think it was clapping or clanging utensils to praise the health workers and to express our solidarity with health workers, and people took to that. Now for us, I mean, I would say it was, you know, when you watch a dance, and you see it choreographed, and you say, oh, that's a great choreographer. Or you hear a wonderful orchestra playing, and then you realize it's not only the orchestra and the instruments, it's the conductor who's conducting each and every piece of that orchestra. So yes, it is true that what we saw in the initial stages was political choreography backed by the state, there's no doubt about it. It was not just a spontaneous response. But still, at times like this sometimes, even symbols of political choreography do have a message. And they do tend to bring out what is common in the situation. And at that time, what was common in the situation was the resolve that yes, we must save ourselves and we must save our country from the virus, from the impact of the virus, and we have to do it keeping our health workers in mind, as the Prime Minister at that time had said. And then came the lockdown. So that unity which we saw, the lockdown could have sustained it if it had been a planned lockdown. It was possible. After all, the government of Kerala did it. Before the stringent measures they took about physical distancing and locking down many parts of the state, the government of Kerala, the LDF government of Kerala, had announced a 20,000 crore package, which was of direct benefit to the people, putting money in the pockets of the people so that they would have a buffer to get through the next week, to get through the next two weeks, till the government could get the systems in place. When you have a national lockdown of 130 crore people, what is the planning? You announce it at 9 o'clock at night and the next morning it's a lockdown? You don't give people any time? Does this government have no idea about the socioeconomic re realities 
of the crores of workers in the unorganized sector and still keeping the instructions of the government in mind. Think about it. Those 93% of workers in India in the unorganized sector who suddenly, without notice, had their lifelines cut. They didn't all come out onto the streets. Yes, some did because they felt they have to go home. But even then the government did not announce anything. Is that not an impediment to unity? That is my question. I'm not even looking at it from the rights of the workers. I'm not even looking at it from, from the suffering of the workers. I'm not even thinking in my mind about the reality of that young girl, that chili picker, who walked from Telangana to Chhattisgarh and died a few kilometers away from her village because she needed to get home. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the overarching requirement of what the government has said. We need unity. But this is the first impediment to that unity. The refusal of the government to understand a basic reality that the lockdown and the virus has imposed a disproportionately heavy burden on the laboring classes of India. The majority of the Indian people, and now with the harvesting going on and the total lack of procurement support, procurement price support, I was told that according to a survey which will be in the public domain soon, four days ago when they compared the Mondays last year to the Monday arrivals on the Monday, they said it was just 6%. So we can imagine what the Kisans are going through. But the government, what is this unity? How can you have unity or sustain unity when the government's role in ensuring that that disproportionate burden is lightened doesn't happen? What is this one lakh seventy thousand crores? Is the fast? Talk about Manrega wages, Are Baba, give them 100 days work and then talk about how much that they're going to get 2,000 rupees more a month. What is a joke? It's a cruel joke. Look at the food grains. The latest figures on April 4th, 5.4 crore tons of food grains in stocks, in the go-downs. You have to make space for others. What do they do first? They tried to offload it on NGOs doing relief. Look at the shame of it. They couldn't sell it at commercial price. They couldn't sell it at the prices they fixed. From January till now, they've been trying to sell their buffer stocks. They couldn't do it. Now they're telling NGOs, buy it at the higher prices and give relief. Do they have any shame? And now yesterday we've heard that they want to convert it into ethanol and hand sanitizers. They don't want to give it to the people. They don't want to give free food grains. And still they are going for Aadhaar card, they're going for biometric proof, they're going for ration card proof, and millions, everybody knows millions of workers, millions of migrants don't have these identifications. So the point is that unity in the people's hearts you are exploiting. by continuing to follow a set of policies, of economic policies, which are nakedly capitalist in nature, you do not even want to learn the lessons that other capitalist countries, they don't learn from China, don't learn from socialist countries, don't learn from Cuba, learn from capitalist countries. Today, when workers are being thrown out of work because the largest number of workers are in SMEs, everybody knows that, small and medium 
enterprises. They are saying we can't manage. Exports are down. Obviously, who's going to now, from abroad, who's going to take our products? It's all completely collapsed. In every industrial area, even if you start tomorrow, it's not going to happen. But there's no backup for wages, there's no backup for salaries. You just say, yeah, we are appealing to employers to please give, we're appealing to landlords, don't throw out workers. This is a farce, it is a mockery. And it means this government is really not interested in uniting India, except for political choreography. And that's not going to work. That can't sustain a nation. It cannot sustain a people going through so much suffering. So the first impediment is to unity is the obstinacy of the Modi government to continue to pursue policies, continue to be obsessed with fiscal deficits rather than with the hunger haunting crores of people in India. So we want unity and to sustain and support and strengthen that unity we want this government to give free food grades. Give low interest loans. Give a backing to the small and medium scale enterprises to ensure that at least 70 to 80 percent of the salaries of their workers are paid. These are the very minimum. And as far as the other aspect of the health workers, the need for much more protection for our health workers, I've just seen a circular sent by the government in which they say doctors will be in hotels, nurses will be in hotels, staff will be in dharamshalas. Now, of course, doctors and nurses must be in hotels. We fought for that right for the nurses. They were put in the worst kind of conditions. So definitely doctors and nurses must have the best. But what about the staff in hospitals? You want to put them in dharamshalas. What is a dharamshala? A big dormitory. What is the protocol? They have 14 days duty. And I'm saying in COVID, in hospitals which are dedicated for COVID patients or for quarantine patients in all across India, there are such centers, medical centers. So for the staff there, what is the protocol? You do two weeks duty, you do two weeks in quarantine, and then you go home. Now in that quarantine period, should the staff be put in dharamshalas? Can you be in quarantine in a dharamshala in a dormitory? Where are the single rooms? Why is, this, why is the safety of the staff, the sanitation workers, the cleaners, all the other aspects of the employees of a hospital on COVID duty who are risking their lives as much as anybody else? Why Dharamshal? I'm just giving you an example to show that in every single area, what about the ashas? 10 lakh ASHA workers all over India, Anganwaris, who are right there on the front line in rural areas. Fortunately, we have not got any information that it's spread in rural areas, but still, there are people going from the cities, there are people who the ASHA workers have to confront every day going house to house in a campaign. What do they have? Do they have proper equipment? No. Do they have proper facilities? No. Today, the government has brought a new law to protect health workers. Good. We need that law because wherever health workers are being attacked, we strongly condemn it. We condemn what happened in Moradabad. We condemn what happened in Palghar. We condemn it. We condemn the attacks on ASHA workers. But what about the protection that ASHA workers need? You don't want to give it to them? You don't want to spend any of your money. 
You can bring a law and put people in jail because they've said this and that, fine. But that's not gonna save our health workers. So the economic aspect, I think, is a very important and a very crucial aspect of policy which must change and which is an impediment. I don't know how much more time I have, but the other impediment, I think you all know, um, what has happened after the Tablighi Jamaat congregation here in Delhi and the highly responsible uh, behavior of the leadership of the Jamaat. Of course, we are still waiting for the investigation as to how they could hold it in the first place and who gave the permissions. That has not yet come in the public domain. So we are waiting for that because it's very difficult to believe that in the heart of the city, in a place called Nizamuddin, there was a congregation of 5,000 people after the government of Delhi had given very strict instructions that not more than 20 people, I think it was at that time, and later they brought it down to five, can meet together or congregate. It was very clear. So how come 5,000 people were here? So that's a matter of investigation. But regardless of that, it was highly responsible of the Jamaati leadership to go through with that congregation at such a time, and especially having people from outside. So following that, we all know what happened. We know about the concerted campaign. Now I can understand, we were all enraged that such congregation could have taken place, but do you give it a communal color? Do you demonize a whole community at a time when you're talking about unity? And we have a prime minister who remains silent until the UN and even the United States of America came out with cautionary notices saying, be careful. Don't give the virus a communal nature by calling it in communal terms. Identifying it with the community. No, don't do that. After that, the Prime Minister spoke, and even then, he didn't attack his trolls. He didn't. He didn't take any action <clears throat> against all those who were so dead, deadly uh, active in spreading all that communal toxic rubbish. But it had its impact. The Delhi Minority Commission had to come out with a statement saying, do not give a breakdown that this is the reason why it's, and blame it all on the Tablighi Jamaat. It's not true. And because you're doing that, this breakdown you are giving from the national capital, it's leading to attacks on minorities all over India. So that is one aspect of it. And I think because of the international reaction, that stopped. But what has happened now, recently? Just today we have had to issue a statement. The entire Middle East, West Asia, where so many Indians, and especially Indians from Kerala, from Tamil Nadu, from many parts of the South, who are working there, in the UAE, for example, they are facing so much trouble because the anti-minority hatred on social media has reached those countries. They are aware of what is being said against a whole community and they are reacting to it. Are Indians there? They are having to face it. These wretched trolls here who can tell such lies who could communalize anything? Do they realize the impact such a campaign is having on those who are outside India? Those who are working in those countries where there are regimes led by those who believe in Islam? Do they have any idea about what the impact is? We are to issue a statement today, strongly condemning it. They are making so many arrangements for our people. But they, they have no idea because 
It is not unity that they are talking about. They have not given up their agenda during this pandemic. That's what becomes clear. And I would also like to add, although this is in a way you can say it is Delhi specific, and that is the arrests which have been taking place. Now, many of you know as students what happened in the anti ca protests. You know what happened in JNU. You know what happened in Jamia. I'm not going to repeat that right now. You all are very well aware of it. But what seems to be a pattern here in Delhi is that the communal violence in Delhi, of course, both communities were affected. Both communities suffered losses, suffered damage, suffered. Both communities did. But there is absolutely no doubt, according to the facts, that the Muslim community suffered manifold times more. I hate doing this. I hate comparing. But the fact is that backed by the police, those who are inspired by the ideology of Hindutva were on a rampage. The number of people killed, the number of houses damaged, the amount of property. It's almost three-fourths, one-fourth. And in such a time, if you look at the arrests which are taking place, it is almost entirely one-sided. They're just picking up young men in that area. I know, because we all work there. From February 26 to March 24th, almost every single day we were there, all of us, all the relief workers, all of us volunteers, we were there. And now we see that those who were victimized at that time, their young men are being picked up. Random. We have gone to court. There's a petition which I have filed in court, apart from the hate speech one, which of course is all on the back burner. Supreme Court doesn't think they're very important. And one of the petitions is a very important one, which says the police has to, under Section 41C of the IPC, they have to let it be known who they are arresting, why they are arresting, and who has arrested them. Nobody knows. We all only know this, that hundreds of young men of the Muslim community are being arrested. And now recently, in the last 10 days to two weeks, they are trying to link up the anti-CA protests with the communal violence in Delhi. And so they're picking up students from Jamia. I read a press report in which they have said they have got a list of 50 people who they are going to call in for interrogation. And I know specifically of a case of this woman counsellor, she was from the Congress party, Ishrit Jahan. She played such a leading role in the anti-CA protest, perfectly, totally peaceful protest, until the police went to smash it up on February the 24th. She was picked up. She is still in jail today. She was given bail in that case of the anti-CA protest. But would you believe it? She was again picked up by the special branch. She is being, Ishra Jahan, a counselor, a former counselor, she is being accused of murder in an area she has never even visited. So she was given bail in a case picked up the same day by the special branch, taken for questioning in their building here in Lodi Colony for two weeks. Then she's in jail, quarantined for two weeks. Nobody can meet her. 
So they want to break the spirit of those who led the protests. This is how the lockdown is being misused by those who talk about unity, but who smash unity by attacking the constitutional guarantees of the right to life, the constitutional guarantees of secularism and equal treatment to all citizens and equal rights to all citizens, and the constitutional guarantee of democracy because they are attacking democracy and democratic rights. And alas, and I'm really sorry and sad to say that the courts of this country who could have at least don't afford protection to individuals but afford protection to the Constitution of India but even that is not being done and therefore it is we the people who have to come together at such a time we have to base ourselves on the need for unity we have to do everything possible to build, to sustain, and to strengthen that unity, while at the same time coming out strongly for a change in these policies, which are, in fact, the greatest impediment to that unity. I think I'm over my time now, and there are a lot of questions which have come. So I, I would like one of the administrators of your panel, because I can hardly read your messages, so is it possible for you to sort of WhatsApp me? I think uh, one of the administrators does have my WhatsApp number. So is it possible to WhatsApp some of the questions? I'll just have a look if you don't mind. Opinion about the Kerala government. How can we control flooding hate news on social media? Blaming minorities spread also like Google's agenda, dividing society. Awaaz uh, kam hai? Kripa sahi kare. Sorry, comrade. Abhi to awaaz ki to abhi to khatam hi ho gaya abhi. Lal sam. Awaaz sahi kare. I'm so sorry. Bohut saathiyo ne kaha ki awaaz ki kami rahi hai is pure election mein. Aap mujhe maaf karenge kyunki ek to ye hai ki bohut mushkil se to ye Wi-Fi connection par hum aagaye aapke paas. और दूसरी बात है कि मेरे पास वो हेडफोन वगैरह है नहीं जिससे मैं उसको कर सकती हूँ अभी किसी ने ये जो कहा माइक्रोफोन है नहीं मैं बस अपनी आवाज से और वो साउंड जो इस आईपैड पे है उसी से मैं आपके पास पहुँच रही हूँ आप मुझे शमा करेंगे कि मेरे पास वो टेक्नोलॉजी नहीं है समय सिर्फ यही आईपैड है बाकी तो सब हमारे दफ्तर में हैं जो अभी लॉकडाउन की स्थिति में हम लोग भी हैं तो मैं ये कहना चाह रही थी कि हजार रुपया तो ट्रांसफर कीजिए डायरेक्ट ट्रांसफर अभी हम कह रहे कम से कम साढ़े सात हजार रुपया कीजिए क्योंकि आपने दो हफ्ते और बढ़ा दिया आप न जाने कब तक आप बढ़ाएंगे लेकिन बिगेर कैश के और फूड ग्रेन्स की दोनों चीजों की जरूरत है तो ये पैकेज जितने भी लेट होगा उतना ही सफरिंग होगा अभी हम लोगों ने एक सर्वे किया है माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स का दिल्ली में और मैं आपको बताना चाहती हूँ कि सर्वे के द्वारा दिखाया जा रहा है कि अभी लगभग दस हजार सिर्फ दस हजार की एक भी माइग्रेंट वर्कर नहीं है जिसके पास कैश बचा है अपने फोन्स को भी वो रिचार्ज नहीं कर पा रहे तो ये सवाल बिल्कुल सही है कि समय के अंदर आपने नहीं किया कम से कम अभी तो आप तुरंत कीजिए ये बहुत जरूरी है ये हम लोगों ने कहा बहुत सारे सवाल है कैन यू एलेबोरेट ऑन द डेंजर्स ऑफ रिवर्स माइग्रेशन एज लॉकडाउन व्हाट इज द टाइम हराइजन यू आर सीइंग फॉर दिस माय पॉइंट इज वेरी सिंपल पीपल वांट टू गो होम यू कैन नॉट स्टॉप देम यू शुड नॉट स्टॉप देम एंड यू हैव टू मेक दोज अरेंजमेंट्स हम कैसे ये कह सकते हैं कि नहीं हम लोग तो अपने घरों में बैठे हैं लेकिन तुम जो मजदूर हो तुम नहीं जा सकते हो जो बाहर गए थे उनको हमने वापस लाए अच्छा किया हमने 
मैं उनमें नहीं हूँ जो कहते हैं अरे प्लेन्स को आपने वापस ले आए क्यों ले आए जब मजदूर नहीं मैं मैं नहीं कहती हूँ अगर कोई आना चाहता है सरकार की जिम्मेदारी होती है आज अगर मजदूर वापस जाना चाहते हैं केरल सरकार ने एक बिल्कुल सही सुझाव दिया आप लॉन्ग डिस्टेंस नॉन स्टॉप ट्रेन करवाइए ऑर्गेनाइज तरीके से माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स को आप वापस लेकर जाइए जैसे आपने कोटा में स्टूडेंट्स को वापस लेकर गए मैं नीतीश कुमार से बिल्कुल सहमत नहीं हूं आप क्या कह रहे हैं नीतीश जी आप यहां के बिहारी वोट के लिए दिल्ली में आप कैंपेन कर सकते हैं पूर्वांचली वोट लेकिन जब वो मजदूर कहते मैं घर जाना चाहते आप कहते खबरदार तुम मत आ तुम कोरोना वायरस लेकर आओगे नहीं यहां टेस्टिंग के बाद जो फ्री है कोरोना वायरस से उनको ट्रेन्स का इंतजाम कीजिए बसेस का इंतजाम कीजिए अपने प्रदेशों में क्वारंटीन फैसिलिटीज काफी समय आपको मिला आप कीजिए और एक निश्चित समय में आप बारी बारी अलग अलग तरीके से आप माइग्रेंट्स की घर वापसी का आप हर हालत में इंतजाम कीजिए आप कब कर सकते हैं आप कैसे कर सकते हैं आपका क्या स्टेजेस अलग अलग होंगे मैंने कह रही हूं कि एक समय एक करोड़ लोग सब चले जाएंगे आप बारी बारी आप एक टाइम टेबल बनाइए शहरों में जहां ज्यादातर माइग्रेंट वर्कर है और उसके लिए आपको करना चाहिए इसलिए मैं समझती हूं कि जो सरकारें आज कह रहे हैं नहीं नहीं मैं अपने माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स को वापस नहीं लूंग यहाँ लेकर आएंगे ये मैं समझती हूँ This is an act of criminal callousness. It should not be done like that. They should make arrangements with a proper plan, not anarchy with a proper plan. Now, when you look at the experience of China, Cuba, Vietnam, of course there are different experiences in the socialist system, and uh, the most important thing is there's no differential treatment. as far as the citizens are concerned and the government takes the responsibility it doesn't farm it out it doesn't outsource it to ngos of course ngos have an important role to play civil society is a very important role to play but nobody and nothing can substitute government and the greatest lesson to learn is that these governments of the socialist countries they are accountable they take the responsibility they provide the facilities and that is the difference but even today if you look at the others of course the main economic stimulus is for capital there's no denying that it is entirely a stimulus for capital in the capitalist countries particularly if you look at the american stimulus however there is a component in it which is far better than india so my point is this covid crisis has shown that one of the foundations of the new liberal policy which is retreat of the state from its responsibilities cutting down of state expenses on public services covid has shown that this is totally and utterly untenable and not feasible if populations are to be saved so i think that is a very important lesson which it has taught us and we should teach capitalism to fir ek baat hai ki pandemic or adverse economic impacts demand a systemic restructuring yes of course as i have said uh the systemic restructuring that is required is what we have always held the importance of government responsibilities for the provision of public services which must be universal in nature we cannot have privatization we cannot have huge charges for what should be public service so called user charges which most people cannot afford and particularly after the aftermath of this lockdown and the pandemic this becomes all the more necessary and i think along with that more sustainable our own practices are 
practices in health, our practices, our, our civic duties. I think citizens too will have to learn the importance of those aspects also. And there's a very good question here about the life and livelihood of women. And I have not gone into the, when I talked about the disproportionate burden on the laboring classes, I did not go into the other social aspects, the gender aspect of it, the caste aspect of it, which are very, very important. Because when we talk about the background and context, we are talking about a, a society based on discrimination, a society in which the caste system is predominant, it prevails. And I don't know if you've seen an article written by my colleague Subhashini, who has actually documented all the cases of caste discrimination, caste violence uh, against Dalits in this entire period of the lockdown, which shows very clearly that you talk about unity, but you're not willing to destroy or do away with the caste system in India. So when you talk about restructuring and dealing with COVID, you have to also deal with the social systems which are embedded in this country and embedded in social discrimination, like the caste system and patriarchal relations. And if you look at the way that women are impacted, one, of course, is laborers, is workers. And the fact that the largest number of women are in the unorganized sector, who obviously, therefore, would be suffering most. The second aspect is the nature of the work, the home-based work, for example, the outsourcing in, in home-based product work, which is linked to the production process. And there also, with all the factories closed, that very, very important avenue of earning, which women were doing, has been completely blocked. And there's absolutely no compensation even thought about those who are doing home-based workers. The third sector, which is deeply impacted, the construction sector, where there's a large number of women, and of course, the domestic worker sector. And here in Delhi, I can give you examples where we have found that even in the poshest colonies, when we have been receiving distress calls from women domestic workers, mainly women domestic workers, the employers say, don't come to the house. Obviously, don't go to the house during lockdown, but we're not going to give you your money. So they're not even being paid. And these are colonies which have very well-to-do people. So women domestic workers are a huge section of the population, urban India specifically, who are being very badly affected. And if you look at the rural areas, agricultural workers, Manrega workers, they're also women. So one category would be the impact of this on women as far as their work is concerned because they belong to the laboring classes. The second aspect is within the home. Now, when you have an entire family locked in the home and you have patriarchal dominant relations where the woman is supposed to be doing all the work, that much more of a burden of domestic work on her is enormous. The tensions are enormous. And at a time where in a large number of majority of households in India who do not have minimum livelihood facilities or incomes, in such a situation of tension, violence also grows. And there are, although we don't have uh, very direct evidence as far as data is concerned yet, but we know from the helplines which uh, many of our women's organizations, including the All India Democratic Women's Association, in many states is running, we do find um, many women coming to us asking for help and counseling of their husbands also um, because of the domestic violence, the increase in domestic violence, and particularly we're extremely concerned where already there are problems within the family, the issues of child abuse, of domestic violence. These are very critical issues uh, which women, as women, as women as workers and as women as part of a caste, uh, already discriminated if she's a Dalit. Adivasi women today who uh, are finding it extremely, extremely difficult because there is absolutely no way. They're not allowed to go into the forest. There's no minor forest produce. There's no sale of it. In so many remote areas, there is no facility whatsoever to get even uh, any kind of help, even 
and emergency help required for health purposes also. So there is a differential in class terms and also in social terms, which is being borne by specific sections of our society, including women, including Dalits, including Adivasis. I think we're well away, well out of town. I mean, out of time. Again, the issue of the uh, media, social media, uh, as I said, I really, I, I'm telling you, because we just face it all the time, the kind of trolling which goes on. But I think that there are enough people in India, enough young people like you. I think it is a responsibility that you have, really, to come out strongly for the values you believe in and not to be cowed down. I know you're not cowed down by these people. Our tribe has to increase. We have to be more active. We can't just be dismissive about it, saying, Are you social media? Kya hai? Kon dekhta hai? Hamari class ki to nahi dekhte hai, isle hame is me kyu parwa karna hai. Likin hame karna parega, kyu ke ham nahi dekhte hai, likin loo ki demag me, WhatsApp ki through, ye tamam nahi technologies ki through, kitna sabara hai. To hame bhi is prakar ke active ho kar. इनको जवाब देने की जरूरत है क्योंकि आज अगर मैं आपको यह जवाब दूं कि कानून है कानून को अमल में लाए अरे कोर्ट्स जब खुलेंगे तो देखी जाएगी लेकिन अभी कोई कोर्ट नहीं सुन रहा है हमारे कितने केसेस पेंडिंग हैं हां उनकी मर्जी सरकार तो अपने केसेस सब करवा करवो के सबको बंद करवा सकते हैं वो एक अलग बात है आज हम लीगल पोजीशन पे हमारा मेन थीम ऑफ डिस्कशन नहीं है जो बहुत इंपॉर्टेंट है लेकिन फिर भी मैं कहती हूं खुद हम लोग एक्टिव होकर क्योंकि बहुत लोग हैं हिंदुस्तान में जो इसके खिलाफ हैं जो इस हिंदुत्व की जहरीला जो प्रचार है उसके खिलाफ है अब आप बताइए अब एक और है ऑन व्हाट डू यू थिंक ऑफ महाराष्ट्र गवर्नमेंट माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स नहीं देखिए महाराष्ट्र गवर्नमेंट का कसूर नहीं है क्योंकि महाराष्ट्र गवर्नमेंट कह रही कि माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स को महाराष्ट्र में रहने की जरूरत है क्योंकि अगर झारखंड की बिहार की बंगाल की जहां जहां से माइग्रेंट वर्कर्स आए हैं वहां अगर वो सरकारें इंतजाम करते हैं तभी यहां से वो जा सकते हैं तो ये तो सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट को पहल कदमी करना चाहिए और जहां तक महाराष्ट्र के अगर कोई मजदूर बाहर हैं जो बहुत जाते हैं विशेषकर आदिवासी मजदूर बहुत जाते हैं मैं खुद जानती हूं बहुत जाते हैं बाहर कहीं भी पड़ोसी प्रदेशों में जाते हैं विशेषकर फसल के टाइम पर और वहां फिर 6 महीना 8 महीना रह जाते हैं तो वो भी अगर अगर घर अपना लौटना चाहते हैं तो ये महाराष्ट्र सरकार की निश्चित रूप पर जिम्मेदारी बनती है कि वो कम से कम आवाज उठाए सरकार की सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट के साथ कि आप इंतजाम कीजिए हमारे वर्कर्स के लिए कि हम अपने वर्कर्स को अपने प्रदेश में वापस लाना चाहते हैं मैं समझती हूं यही सही रहेगा क्योंकि हम जानते हैं जो आदिवासी वहां जाते जब लॉकडाउन में नहीं था जो वहां जाते शुगर केन कटिंग के लिए या कोई भी काम वहां होता है जब वो वहां जाते हैं और जब लौटते हैं इतना अच्छा वो कहते हैं कि भई हम लौट रहे अपना घर काम करने के बाद और आज हम कह रहे कि नहीं तुम अपना घर नहीं लौट सकते हो ये सही नहीं होगा तो इंतजाम करने में फिर भी कहती हूं इंतजाम के साथ कोई भड़काने वाली बात नहीं है सरकार को इंतजाम करने की जरूरत है और जब तक सरकार इंतजाम नहीं करती हमारा काम है हम सरकार से बराबर ये बात रखते रहे कि भई मजदूरों की वापसी के लिए आप इंतजाम करना शुरू कर लीजिए ये हमारा कहना है ऑन बहुत सारे ग्रीटिंग्स आ रहे थैंक यू सबको बहुत-बहुत धन्यवाद अब क्या करें बताइए हम तो जाके मिलते थे सबसे लेकिन अभी हम ऐसे बुरी तरह यहां फंसे हुए हम क्या बताएं 
अब यू ये देखिए जिस तरह यू को किया है और मुझे बहुत खेद है कि हम हफ्तार किया कोविड के टाइम पे जबकि कोई एविडेंस नहीं आज तक जिनके ऊपर सुधा भरद्वाज और वरवर राव और जितने महेश रौत जितने भी हमारे साथी वहाँ बंद है और मैं कहती हूँ हमारे साथी हैं हमारी पॉलिटिक्स अलग हो सकती है लेकिन वो लोग हैं जो आदिवासियों के लिए दलितों के लिए आवाज उठाए हैं इसलिए हमारे साथी हैं और जिस तरह यू का दुरुपयोग करके उपयोग का दुरुपयोग नहीं उपयोग करके उनको बंद रखा आज तक कितने महीने हो गए कोई एविडेंस नहीं दे पाए कोई प्रूफ नहीं दे पाए और अभी दो और को कर लिया मैं समझती हूँ कम से कम जब आप लॉकडाउन कर रहे हैं आप ह्यूमन राइट्स की लॉकडाउन क्यों कर रहे हैं आप तो ह्यूमन राइट्स की लॉकडाउन कर रहे हैं आप तो डेमोक्रेटिक राइट्स की लॉकडाउन कर रहे हैं ये क्या है आपका तरीका ये तो बंद कीजिए लेकिन ये है मोदी सरकार तो एक तरफ तो हम कहते हैं नेशनल यूनिटी हम सरकार की पूरे इंस्ट्रक्शंस को हम स्वयं हमारी पार्टी हमारे हर कार्यकर्ता इसको मानकर स्वीकार करके चाहे हमारी कोई भी राय हम अमल ला रहे हैं लेकिन सरकार अपनी जिम्मेदारी पूरा नहीं कर रही है और यही सबसे ज्यादा नुकसान हमारे देश के लिए है अब मेरे प्यारे कॉमरेड्स बहुत हो गया है और अभी मुझे भी जाना है और काम भी है और आप लोगों से मिलने के लिए मैं टिस के प्रोग्रेसिव स्टूडेंट्स फोरम को बहुत धन्यवाद देती हूँ शुक्रिया एक समय भी होगा निश्चित जब मैं खुद ही आके आप सबसे मिलूंगी टिस में तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद मेरे तरफ से सलाम और एक बार फिर कॉमरेड लेनन के उस 150वें जन्म दिवस पर आप सबको क्रांतिकारी अभिनंदन करते हुए मैं आपको एक बार फिर सलाम मेरे प्यार आप सबके लिए थैंक यू कम